Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Key Battles of World War I. In the previous episode, we looked at battle number six, the Brusilov Offensive. Russia makes major territorial gains against the Central Powers. The Austro-Hungarian Empire is basically knocked out of the war. They're not going to do much except for trench duty. We're going to take a step out of the battles, and we're going to be looking at something that I think people really enjoy when they learn about this in World War I, and that's the air war. Aviation is still in its infancy at this time period in the 19-teens. And in the beginning of the war, many still thought of planes as not that much more than a toy. What an airplane did was observe the movements of the enemy and do reconnaissance. This is a huge upgrade from tethered balloons. And James and I saw in the Civil War when we did that series that observation balloons were used frequently. Wouldn't be fun to be shot at one of those if that happened. And they were also used in the Franco-Prussian War. Balloons are still used in World War I in spotting artillery, but even the primitive airplanes that exist in 1914, and keep in mind this is barely a decade after the Wright brothers, can provide details that balloons never could. Now, obviously the idea of using airplanes for combat didn't begin with World War I. Military strategists had dreams of its potential as soon as they saw the technology in action. But I like to imagine that the beginning of gunfights between planes happens when there maybe were a French and German reconnaissance plane circling over the same field, they would circle around each other. They would look at each other and realize, wait, you're the enemy. Are we just going to fly by each other? One of them pulls out a pistol and starts firing. And that is the beginning of aerial warfare. That's not how it happened, but that's how I would <laughs> like it to imagine it happening. It should have happened that way. I mean, they do use that. Then they upgrade rifles. They even use uh grappling hooks, they drop bombs by hand, and then they're going to upgrade to actual serious weaponry. But you had a personal experience with World War I aircraft when you were growing up. What was that, James? Yeah, well, it got me interested in World War I in general in an indirect way. It was actually a game. I talked earlier in an episode way back at the beginning about the game Diplomacy, which got me really interested in the lead up to the war. And then I also played a game called Ace of Aces. And Ace of Aces was an air combat game where each player had a book and you used the book to make maneuvers. And if you got lucky, fire at your enemy and the first one to get shot down loses. <laughs> the first one to s still be alive in the air wins. So it was kind of a fun game and there were elaborate advanced versions you could play. But I started playing this when I was in eighth grade and played it through high school. So that kind of ignited my interest in World War I air combat. It's one of my favorite aspects of the war. Yeah, it really is a lot of fun, and I, I think what makes it so enjoyable for people is that the pilots at this time are kind of like knights. They were called the knights of the air, and one way you could think of them as knights is that they engage in single combat against another knight, and the hopes and dreams of a nation or kingdom are invested in one person, and that one man represents the nation, and if he wins in single combat, then the rest of the nation wins. It's sort of like what uh, Tom Wolf described in his book, The Right Stuff, about the astronauts that were part of the Mercury program uh, before the Apollo missions. And he said that in the Cold War, astronauts also had this kind of allure of engaging in single combat. And this is what knights are, and they have, or this is what pilots are, and they have this spirit too. And the press loved pilots. They made them matinee idols. The militaries used them for propaganda purposes to create heroes for the public to adore. Uh, they did one of the most dangerous things that you possibly could do in the war. But since almost everyone was going to die anyway, and it gave you a break from the trenches, I'm sure not that many people minded. So let's talk about the development of air combat. Where does it all begin? All right. Well, since the first successful flight of an airplane, people had imagined and dreamed of airplanes being used for combat. Of course, as soon as anything is ever invented, somebody says, well, what, how can we use it to blow people up? Let's or militarize that. Exactly. Yeah, of course. For example, H.G. Wells, the famous science fiction author, he wrote a book called The War in the Air in 1908. He was one person in an early, I don't want to say exponent of air warfare, but he saw what was going to happen. He was he visualized the future. Planes had been used in minor wars beginning in the 1910s, and each great power had formed air branches of the Army and or Navy. 
France had the most developed one. They had the largest air force at the beginning of the war, but it wasn't a separate branch. None of them were actually. They were all attached to either the army or the navy. Britain had two <laughs> air services. They had the Royal Flying Corps, which was part of the army, and the Royal Naval Air Service, which was part of the navy. Those would eventually be merged into the Royal Air Force, which would be the first independent air service in 1917. But of course, that's well into the war. The German service was called the Luftstreitkraft. I just like to say German words. They're so long and, and majestic. But So yeah, when the war broke out, there were only about a thousand planes on all sides. If you add them all up, maybe you have a thousand. Planes were very basic. At first, cockpits were open, instruments were rudimentary, and there were no navigational aids. Pilots had to use maps, no GPS, no nothing like that. You know, you just actually pull out a paper map hope, and try to keep the plane in the air at the same time. The maps were not always reliable. Pilots frequently got lost. Sometimes they had to land and ask directions. That, to me, that's a funny, excuse me. Excuse uh, me, farmer, where is the army? <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me where the German front line is? Uh, it's just crazy. But at the beginning of the war, airplanes were used almost exclusively for reconnaissance. They were taking the job formerly done by cavalry. They were also used for artillery spotting and range finding. But flying reconnaissance missions was dangerous, of course, because the other side doesn't want you doing reconnaissance. They don't want you to know where all your stuff is and all your guys are. So they would be shot at. Eventually, it became necessary for planes to eliminate the observation planes of the enemy. So that is the beginning of air-to-air -air combat, also known as dogfights. And they became very common. Plane technology improved greatly throughout the war. I, I, you'd much rather be flying a 1918 plane than a 1914 plane. Specialized planes began to emerge. You had seaplanes, fighters, bombers. There were biplanes, meaning two wings, and triplanes with three wings. Popular makes include the Newport, uh, which was French, uh, the Sopwith Pup, and the British Sopwith Camel, which, of course, is the plane that Snoopy flew in the Peanut series, <laughs> the Sopwith Camel. Uh, the, on the German side, you had several different Fokker, uh, or Fokker triplanes and, and biplanes. Plane speeds increased throughout the war, at the beginning of the war, they were roughly 75 miles an hour uh, maximum, not particularly fast. But uh, by the end of the war, they could fly about twice that fast. Yeah, something like 400 horsepower by the end of the war, if I have it right. Right, yeah. Again, tremendous in technological advancement in just four years. Necessity is the mother of invention, right, Scott? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, had to, you had to have your planes going faster and being more powerful and being able to fire more rounds than the other side. So both sides were constantly making improvements. The air forces increased greatly in size. At the beginning of the war, the British air services had only 300 officers and about 1,800 men. By the end of the war, they had 27,000 officers. That is a 90-fold increase, and they had over 300,000 men. Of course, not all those are pilots. A lot of those are ground crew. They're people who repair, repaired the planes and did other things. France had less than 140 aircraft at the start of the war, but 4,500 at the end of the war, the most of all the powers. Um, also, production of planes increased greatly throughout the war. By the war's end, France was building as many planes every day as the total number they had at the start of the war. <laughs> That's just phenomenal. So at the start of the war, like I said, they had roughly 140. Uh, by the end of the war, they were cranking out 140 every single day. Yeah, that just boggles the mind. I mean, they're really kicking it up, and this is what gives the Allies incredible advantages at the end. Uh, they're outproducing the Germans by something like 5 to 1 in terms of aircraft and 7 to 1 in terms of engines. And you mentioned that statistic with France. The UK is also producing 31 times more aircraft per month than it owned at the beginning of the conflict. They didn't have that many, so it's easy to multiply it, but still very impressive. And uh, the RAF, I think it's the largest air service. I might be wrong on that, but they come into their own in this war. Yeah, France had the most aircraft, but I didn't write down which one had the most people. With I mean, the, Fr the British had... 327,000 people, so that's pretty darn big and may well be the largest. Now, let's talk about the weaponry. 
as Scott alluded to earlier at the beginning of the war, you didn't have weapons installed on the plane. So pilots just shot at each other with <laughs> pistols, rifles, just whatever they could Slingshots, do. Slingshots, whatever. Yeah, that's right. Throw a rock. Trash uh, in the bottom of your cockpit. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that necessarily, but but it was not very well planned. They just, oh, okay, look at that guy. <laughs> then machine guns were installed, but the bullets would often hit the propeller. And you don't want your bullets to hit your propeller because they will tear it up and you will crash. So both sides began installing metal plates on the propeller blades on the backside, the side closer to the pilot and the machine gun. They would deflect the bullets. But of course, that too is problematic because when a bullet gets deflected, it sometimes comes right back at you and that might ruin your whole day. You don't want to get a bullet even <laughs> coming toward you, even if it's deflected. Also, repeated hits would wear off the plates. So that wasn't a good solution either. What else did they do, Scott? They had creative solutions until they finally figured this out. Another idea is to mount the gun directly on top of the wing of a biplane. But this wasn't ideal because the pilot had to reload the machine gun above his head while flying the plane, sometimes during air combat. So I don't know. Imagine driving with one hand while texting, while trying to balance something on your nose. It's a bad idea. You're probably going to crash. Yeah. This method was used by the French pursuit pilots for a period of time during the war until they get it sorted out. So how does that happen? Yeah. And the problem is solved on the German side by an engineer who was actually Dutch and his name was Anthony Fokker, F-O-K-K-E-R. Be very careful how you <laughs> pronounce that, folks. He invented an interrupter gear and this gear synchronized the gun's action with the action of the propeller so that the propeller would, I guess, just stop for a second while the bullets were coming out or the bullets would not, they would not go through when the propeller was right in front of them. So they basically, the bullets fired only through the gaps in the propeller. This invention gave, of course, the central powers air superiority for a while. It was called the Fokker Scourge, but that was only for about a year. After about a year, the allies also figured out how to make this happen and the German advantage was lost. So that's when you get the classic thing that you see in movies of the gun going, you know, and and, and the propeller not getting shot to hell. Yeah, I wonder how that came about. If uh, there was a plane that was recovered and it was reverse engineered or intelligence, uh, probably an interesting story there, but not quite sure. So tell us about the flying experience. It was it sounds really safe to me. It was probably what 100 percent survival rate. Oh, not even <laughs> close. This was, I mean, it was dangerous to be anywhere in this war, to be honest with you, unless you were maybe back at headquarters or something and you were a staff officer. But flying was extremely dangerous. A large percentage of pilots were killed. About 50% of British pilots were killed, as an example. So if you became a pilot, 50-50 chance you weren't going to make it. Of the 68,000 aircraft that France produced during the war, 52,000 were lost in combat. That's a 77% loss rate. So, you know, more than three quarters of French planes were shot down or otherwise made unusable. Training for pilots was, in general, it was inadequate. Pilots got not nearly enough training when they sometimes they went into combat with as little as three and a half hours of training. <laughs> Can you imagine that, Scott? Like, all right, report to uh, headquarters at 8 a.m. and then you're going out on your first mission at noon. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I think just to get a pilot's license, how many thousands of hours does it take in order to get that? So, oh, tons. Yeah. I mean, your average uh, weekend hobbyist today would have way more experience than even the Red Baron at that point. Right. Uh, I think the name that British pilots get called themselves uh, in 1916 and 1917 was the 20 minute club because that was a life expectancy of a new pilot in combat. So not a long lease on life there. It's looking poor if you're a pilot. Yeah. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. 
I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts. They were some of the most powerful men who've ever lived. They waged war, forged peace, and altered the fates of billions of people. And yet, they were just as human, just as flawed as you and me. They were the presidents of the United States, and they are the subjects of the history podcast, This American President. In each episode of This American President, we explore how flawed men have managed this awesome responsibility. To listen now, go to ParthenonPodcast.com or search This American President on your favorite podcast platform. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. Now, air tactics were virtually non-existent at the start of the war. I mean, air warfare in general was almost had almost never been done before, and certainly not on a large scale like it's going to be in this war. So the pilots had to make them up as they went along. But they did a pretty good job, and World War I pilots ended up laying the groundwork for all future air warfare. In particular, there was a German ace. An ace, by the way, is somebody who gets five kills or more. And one of these early aces on the German side was a man named Oswald Belke. He was, he's called the father of the German fighter air force and also the father of air fighting tactics. He wrote, uh, I guess a pamphlet or a document called the eight dicta and they would be highly influential. I thought it might be interesting to read these when I, as I read these things, the listeners, all of us, you know, we've, we've studied, most of us have read about air combat and different wars after this and, and, and we know kind of what pilots have done in battles. So a lot of this is going to seem like, well, duh, it's common sense. But we have to keep in mind that it was not common sense at the time. This was all brand new. And nobody really knew exactly what to do. So Belka kind of lays it down for especially the Germans, but really both sides are going to end up adopting these tactics. So here are the eight dicta of Oswald Belke. Number one, try to secure the upper hand before attacking. Always keep the sun behind you. It makes sense, right? Because you're, you're very hard to see. Number two, always continue with an attack you have begun. Number three, open fire only at close range and then only when the opponent is squarely in your sights. You, know, you don't want to waste ammo. You don't want to just shoot in the air. That, that's not going to do any good. Number four, always try and keep your eye on your opponent and never let yourself be deceived by ruses. Number five, in any type of attack, it is essential to assail your opponent from behind. Again, you always want to get on your opponent's rear so they can't see you for obvious reasons. They didn't have tail gunners back in this day. Uh, Most pilots were single seaters. uh, Most planes were single seaters. Number six, if your opponent dives on you, do not try to get around his attack, but fly to meet it. Number seven, when over the enemy's lines, always remember your own line of retreat. You don't want to, you don't have to bail out over the enemy's lines if you, if you can have any control over it. And then number eight, in principle, it is better to attack in groups of four or six. If fights break up into single combats, pay attention that several comrades do not go after one opponent. So there you go. That seems pretty solid, right, Scott? Yeah. Yeah. Follow those steps and you're guaranteed to be an ace. Yeah, guaranteed. (laughs) Well, if it were only that simple. But uh, I'll give an example of one of the most notable fighter actions of the war. It was Bloody April. It was during the Battle of Arras. And we'll talk about that later. The British Royal Flying Corps lost 245 aircraft with 211 airmen either dead or missing and 108 becoming POWs. (laughs) 
The Royal Flying Corps lost about a quarter of its strength just in this one month. The average life of a replacement airman was 11 days. The Germans in this battle lost only 66 planes, so it was a nearly 4 to 1 kill ratio in this battle in favor of the Germans. Despite this, however, the Royal Flying Corps was able to provide the infantry with excellent intelligence. And this was the greatest percentage loss for the British in the entire war. So really tough, tough time uh, for the British in the Battle of Arras. Yeah, and we're going to get into fighter aces, but I came across some interesting info on the flight suits. This is the case of the RFC. I would imagine it's similar uh, with the Germans, but this can give you a visualization of what they look like. So the flight suits are designed for warmth. Of course, you don't have uh, pressurized cabins. You don't even have those in World War II. You're also not going nearly as high, so you don't need the thick wool jacket they need in World War II. But you're still in an open cockpit going 75 miles an hour, later 150 miles an hour. So you'd have uh, coverall, coveralls that would go over uniforms, and the aircrew would be bundled up further in bad weather. So one commentator said that they look like Eskimos flying with goggles. Uh, <laughs> one piece of equipment they had that you think that they would love, but they didn't immediately embrace was the parachute. This was new technology in World War I. The, um, I think in the 1910s, uh, this is when it came out. It isn't really about the 1920s or 1930s that there are different air vents on it that make them much more reliable. And then that's why you have paratroopers as a major part of World War II, because parachutes are working a much better way. Much like airplanes are still experimental. And pilots didn't think that this piece of silk is going to keep them alive. A lot of pilots actually prefer to take their chances and ride the plane down if it was hit. I mean, you're not going as fast as you were in World War II. You're also not up as high. But one of the biggest fears that they had is that their aircraft was on, if it were on fire. If their aircraft's on fire, then, well, maybe you crash. You don't know if you can get out, if your parachute might be incinerated and it could scatter to pieces if you jump out. No good alternative then. But even if their parachute was on fire, a lot of pilots still didn't use their parachutes. This changes as the war goes on when they realize that they are more effective or you can at least have a better chance of dodging death. But it's only until after the war that they become standard equipment. And there are even plans by the end of World War I to create paratrooper uh, regiments, but this doesn't get implemented in time before the war finishes. It. So that doesn't come till later. Typically, pilots did have better living conditions, almost purely by the fact that they weren't in the trenches. So even if they were part of the 20-minute club, you're not surrounded by rats and vermin and all the things that we talked about in that previous episode. Pilots and aircrew were usually billeted in tents or a nearby farmhouse or village. So when James mentioned the 300,000 that were part of the support crew, I can imagine people are probably lining up way, 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 way for miles out the door to sign up just for how much better it would be to be a mechanic or being in charge of a fuel depot. So that's a little bit about what it, they were equipped with. But tell us about the aces themselves. What were they like, James? Yeah. So as I mentioned before, fighter pilots who obtained five kills were called aces. And only about 5% of pilots achieved this status. So even just to get five kills is a very rare thing among pilots. And that's not surprising since so many of them died up in the air. They, they might not ever get one kill. And as Scott hinted earlier, mentioned aces were almost like the rock stars of the days. They were A lot of them were flamboyant. They developed this personality cult in a way. They were big heroes. People would pass around their pictures and things like that. They were seen as the knights of the air. Air, air combat was seen as special, as elite as you know the the equivalent of back in the old days when you had men in plate armor with lances going after the other side on a horse uh they were seen as maybe better or more again more elite than the guys that were just grinding it down in the trenches fighter aces and fighter pilots in general but especially aces were greatly romanticized they were adored they were believed to embody chivalry and noble nobleness some of the most well-known aces were people like Edric, Edward Manick and Alfred Ball, who were British, Billy Bishop, who was Canadian, Rene Fonk, who was French, uh, 
Eddie Rickenbacker, who was American, also a guy named Raoul Lufberry. And on the German side, we talked already about uh, Belke, but you also had Ernst Udet, Manfred von Richthofen, who was the Red Baron, and a man who was going to be famous for another reason later, who was going to be infamous is the, really the way to put it, Hermann Gehrig. Hermann Gehrig was going to go on to be the commander of the Luftwaffe, the overall supreme commander of the Luftwaffe in World War II, and a really, really bad guy. But of all the aces, the one who had the most kills was Richthofen, the Red Baron. He, uh, he, uh, he also became an instructor and a commander. And I want to give a uh, plug for a very good novel that in which he's a major character. Scott and I, I know that we're always throwing out these movies and books and TV shows, and we'll provide a list for you so you can go back and find them, and we'll annotate it a little bit. But the novel I'm referring to now is called To the Last Man by Jeff Shera. Jeff Shera is the son of Michael Shera, the author of The Killer Angels. And then Jeff Shera wrote Gods and Generals and uh, uh, the, the, the Last Full Measure. That's part of the, that's the Civil War trilogy. And then he went on to write many, many other great historical novels. He's my favorite historical novel author. Uh, but this one's about World War I, To the Last Man, and in that he talks a lot about fighter pilots and especially the Red Baron. Uh, the Red Baron, before uh, he's going to get killed, but before he did that, he also started a great pizza company, which is still around to this day. The <laughs> I Red love Baron their pizza. frozen pizzas. Oh, so oh, good. Oh, man. Yeah, my favorite. Thank you, Red Baron. For no, I'm just kidding, folks. But um Rick Tovin was the leader of a fighter squadron called the Flying Circus, which moved around from battle to battle as needed. He served on the Western and Eastern fronts. But as happens of pretty much every <laughs> fighter pilot at some point or another, in April 1918, he was shot down. Now, who shot him down is, is still a, a little bit of a controversial topic. Maybe it was a Canadian pilot or maybe it was Australian not Austrian, but Australian ground troops were firing on airplanes. We don't really know. He was only 26 years old at the time. And again, most of these pilots were very young. And the Australian pilots, they did something really, really noble. They held a funeral for Rick Toffin. Even though he's on the opposite side, they held a funeral with full military honors. Um, so... It was a joint effort on the part of Canadians and Australians. So that's how much the two sides respected each other, at least at least the pilots did. And uh, one other thing I will mention that Eddie Rickenbacker actually survived the war and he went on to uh, have some fame in other areas. All right. So that's all I had on the aces. Very colorful characters. Yeah, absolutely. And something that I think we'll get into when we talk about when America enters the war well before America enters in 1917, there were a number of Americans who were fighting for France in the French Foreign Legion. Yeah, that's important to mention. Yeah, I've, I left that out. Thanks. Yeah, so Go they ahead, call, officer. So there's, um, I think they called the Escadrille Lafayette, uh, yeah. which is the funny thing about that is the United States, in some senses, wanted to downplay the involvement of Americans in the French Foreign Legion or at least wanted to maintain their neutrality for a while and not make it appear to Germany as if they were openly supplying and providing for the allies. So the, within the, the Escadrille Lafayette, was that part of the French air forces proper or the, the French army proper? I think it was, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was a special division. It was, right. it was eventually shut down after the U S enters the war and those pilots were brought into the, actual American Army Air Corps. Okay, yeah, I think, well, I'll, uh, I was going to mention this at the end of the episode, but I think I'll mention it now. So at this time when American pilots are fighting, not just in the Foreign Legion, but directly on behalf of France in their military, they were going to call it the Escadrille Americaine. But instead of calling it that, they couldn't call it that. They called themselves the Escadrille Lafayette, named after the Marquis de Lafayette, yeah. the Frenchman who famously fought in the Revolutionary War. So that way they're making it very clear to the Germans that they are, in fact, Americans. And that was not lost on them. Yeah, they actually did have the, the word American in the title originally, but the Germans protested. And so they said, OK, we'll change it. <laughs> Lafayette. Lafayette. Well, let's honor Lafayette. 
And someone I want to mention, uh, he's appeared in my podcast before, and I'll have an upcoming episode on him with a guest, John Hagedorn, is um, Gene Hubbard, known as Jacques Hubbard. He's America's first black pilot, and he fought for the French Foreign Legion. He's the first American-born black fighter pilot in history, and then later he flies directly for France. He had two kills. And his story is amazing. He ran away from his home in Georgia. He hopped a freighter to Europe. He was a pro boxer. He was a drummer. He went on to own a nightclub in the Jazz Age. Uh, He joined the French Foreign Legion. He was wounded. Uh, He fought in the French Air Corps during World War I. Sadly, when uh, the Escadrille Lafayette was rolled up into the American military, he was not allowed to fly for them because he was black. So... Big knock against America for that. Uh, But later on, he works in World War II as a spy for French intelligence, and he's later awarded the Croix de Guerre by um, Charles de Gaulle. So amazing guy and uh, great credit to and a great member of the Foreign Legion. Oh, that's great. I can't wait to hear the story. Hey, everyone. Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts. They were some of the most powerful men who've ever lived. They waged war, forged peace, and altered the fates of billions of people. And yet, they were just as human, just as flawed as you and me. They were the presidents of the United States, and they are the subjects of the history podcast, This American President. In each episode of This American President, we explore how flawed men have managed this awesome responsibility. To listen now, go to ParthenonPodcast.com or search This American President on your favorite podcast platform. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. Bombing. We're going to move on to bombing. Yeah, we've talked about fighters and dogfights. Now let's talk about bombing. Bombing was pioneered in the world First World War. At the start of the war, bomber planes mainly dropped grenades, you know, so not, not incredibly powerful. <laughs> uh, Might as well drop but, six of dynamite. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> but, of course, as you will not be surprised to hear, that as the war progressed, the size of the bombs grew increasingly large. Bombing was used, as is always the case in every war, pretty much. It was used on military and civilian targets. The Germans dropped bombs on Belgian and French cities, including Paris. And the main vehicle for their bombings at at the beginning of the war was not airplanes, but it was Zeppelins. And, of course, a Zeppelin is a hydrogen-filled dirigible. It's, It's just a gigantic balloon full of hydrogen. Um, not Led Zeppelin, by the way, <laughs> great band, but, uh, that wouldn't float very well. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I had to work in that somehow, but they were the, so the Zeppelins were used for bombing primarily on British targets beginning in 1915 by the war's end, they could reach an altitude of 27,000 feet. That's pretty high up for a great big blimp, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, airplanes are definitely not getting anywhere close to that. Uh, if you really wanted a death wish, you would go up, but um, they're the main form of long range transportation in the world. Um, I think up into even the 1930s and even when, um, Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic, there were blimp flyers or Zeppelin flyers who shrugged their shoulders and thought, well, we've been doing that for years with absolutely no problem whatsoever. So mm-hmm. yeah, if you want a long range trip and you want to get out of range of a airplane, Zeppelins are great. They're slower, but they go higher. Yeah. And I should mention, too, that the British used blimps and kite balloons, uh, but I think those were filled with helium rather than hydrogen. And those were only used for observation. They certainly didn't use them for bombings. Uh, 
At the start of the war, the Germans had only 11 Zeppelins, but of course they built many more. And throughout the war, by the end of the war, they would have used, they will have used 123 total Zeppelins. About 80 were shot down or collapsed on their own. Now the Zeppelins were the scourge of Great Britain. They conducted more than 50 raids over British soil. It caused a lot of terror and outrage. Of course, a lot of civilians were killed, and not huge numbers. I mean, not thousands and thousands of thousands. Yeah, this isn't killed. this isn't the V two rocket, right? This is not the Battle of Britain or anything like that. But but it was shocking. You know, it was it caused terror. It caused outrage. It was, I think, it was as much psychological warfare as anything else. And the Zeppelin raids began to be phased out in. 1916, where Zeppelins were replaced by long-range bombers, which had been developed. And one one reason for this, not just the advancement of aircraft technology, but also the British had developed incendiary bullets. Those are, are bullets that are designed to explode and catch on fire. And that fire and hydrogen are not a good combination. You do not want to be in a Zeppelin when an incendiary bullet uh, crashes into your the, the inflated part because it will catch on fire and, and burn up and everybody will die. Oh, the humanity. Yeah. In 1917 and 1918, the Germans repeatedly bombed London with airplanes. About 1,400 British civilians were killed in these bombings. The British retaliated. They bombed Zeppelin bases. They bombed chemical weapons factories at first, and then they did long-distance bombing of German cities. So both sides bombed the other side. Both sides hit military as well as civilian targets. Nobody can claim to be the good guy in this. Now, strategic bombings were largely ineffective. So it's not like World War II where you had these massive bombings that were going around the clock for days and days and days. Remember, just think very basic technology. Because of this, by Verdun, long-range bombing missions were phased out in favor of operations on the front. Hmm. So that is a little bit about bombing. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the next thing you'll discuss are aircraft carriers. And as you were d- mentioning those things with bombing raids on cities earlier, we talked about the way that um, tactics that were very rudimentary at this point of uh, what aces would do in the skies – it's almost like World War One is a laboratory or a dry run from what would happen in a massive scale in World War Two, where you would have bombers that would rain bombs uh, thousands and thousands and thousands on a city or, or even just the tactic of targeting a city across the channel. Once you have long range mm-hmm. bombers, then you're setting your sights on using that. And I could imagine uh, Nazi command thinking back to their experiences in World War One, many of them being veterans, of course, and remembering that, well, we killed over a thousand British civilians at the end of the Great War. What if we did this for hundreds of thousands or even millions of civilians? That would Mm -hmm. completely destroy their morale and cause them to exit the war. So all these things are taking a dry run and uh, aircraft carriers too. um, James will describe in a second what they are. And if you imagine something very rickety and barely working, that's a good description for almost everything in World War I when it's a new technology. Uh, this is going to reach its climax, I, I would argue, in the Battle of Midway in World War II. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's the first battle, they say, where there are enemy fighters and they have no sight of land anywhere. They're completely fighting over open water because they're so far mm-hmm. away from their aircraft carriers. This mm-hmm. is only an apple in the eye of strategists in World War I, but it all begins right here. So what do aircraft carriers look like in the Great War? Yeah, I, by the way, I have to say I love carriers. Uh, I play this. I think I've mentioned before I play a World War II game called Axis and Allies, and I, I always buy a lot of carriers. They're they're very powerful. Carriers eventually are going to make battleships basically obsolete, but of course that's many many years off during World War One. Uh, aircraft carriers are just in their absolute infancy, like so many other technologies we've seen, like tanks, for example, and even fighter planes. In the early 1910s, planes first took off and landed from stationary ships. These were American planes and ships, by the way. Haven't talked too much about American stuff so far, but of course we will before too long. In 1912, two years later, a British plane took off from a moving ship for the first time. So we're making progress. Now the ship is moving. But 
it took a few years more for somebody to land on a moving ship. It's hard. The landing is much harder than the taking off. Five years later, a British commander named Edwin Dunning landed on a moving ship. So that's 19, that's 1917. The first carrier launched as airstrike was the Tondern raid in July, 1918. So very, um, the war is getting close to being over with in this strike. Seven, Sopwith camels, one of which was piloted by Snoopy, launched <laughs> from the con- <laughs> okay, maybe not, but they launched from the converted battle cruiser HMS Furious, and they damaged the German airbase at Tondern. Tondern, I'm sorry, Germany, and they destroyed two Zeppelin airships just for good measure. And in 1918, the HMS Argus became the world's first carrier capable of launching and recovering naval aircraft. So again, uh, like Scott said, the this is like the laboratory, the workshop. Think about a baby that's just started to take its first steps. As that's kind of like World War One, whereas World War Two is like a sprinter. <laughs> you know, that, that same kid, maybe 10, 15 years later, running at full speed. Whereas in World War II, carriers are going to play a huge role, especially in the Pacific. Here, it's the war is almost over before you have one carrier that can actually launch and recover naval aircraft, and you have major battles. Right. So all that's these... all I have about carriers. Not too much to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's another thing, too. Uh, this is a proof of concept that I'm sure – is going to keep military strategists awake at night, putting together their own Schlieffen plans on what to do for the next war. And we had talked about earlier with parachutes, and they're not really proved out until the 1930s. Uh, another thing that helps is, um, I forget the name of, there's a special type of cord that's developed where a group of paratroopers can jump out of a plane, and it automates the pulling of their cord on their parachute, so that it's, it's just simply much easier to drop a whole bunch of paratroopers out at once. Paratroopers aren't used at all in World War I, but they become a fixture of World War II. And with aircraft carriers, once Pearl Harbor happens and America turns on its full engines of war and shifts over its industry into a war economy, aircraft carriers are one of the first things developed. Uh, when was Midway, James, the Battle of Midway? That 1942? It was uh, nine, June, May or June of 1942. Right. I'm That's... That's not very long. I mean, I don't know how soon these aircraft carriers are being churned out after uh, Pearl Harbor. But, I mean, by the end of the war, it's shocking how fast these things are coming off. It's practically an assembly line for building yeah. something that large. But it's understood by um, the generals in the U.S. Army Air Force that these are the cornerstone of naval power. This is what will allow us to win. And, in, indeed, that is what it is. It's all about aircraft carriers. So I could imagine, uh, I'm not a historian of the Air Force by any means whatsoever, but I could see lots of little Schlieffen plans being cooked up by um, military intelligence in the 30s and 40s about what to do with aircraft carriers and seeing things that are just barely possible in World War I being fully realized. So there's a lot of things that are happening here that are going to emerge fully formed decades later. 